Welcome everyone to the Starting Point Education Channel. Um, tonight's podcast is Doing Grief Well, Surviving the Holidays. Pat Opes have joined, has joined us. I am Loretta Depka and look forward to interviewing Pat and hearing from her all helpful, useful tips. So if you don't know Pat Opes, you should know that um, she specializes in grief and loss and always corrects me when I just say grief. She always adds the loss to it, that it's an important um, way to talk about grief. She began practice more than 20 years ago and she's an LCSW and a life coach. And about 19 years ago is when she started to specialize in grief after the loss of her infant son, Ricky. So Pat, if I miss something, please jump in here and uh, you can always uh, add something to your background, I'm sure. So well, I, don't, I don't think I need to add anything from that. Thank you. Um, so a couple weeks ago, a, I was talking with a client about the holidays and I was saying that I was going to do this podcast and I said, grief during the holidays and I didn't finish my sentence and she said sucks <laughs> and I said and and you know uh, I hope nobody's offended by that word but that's the way she felt and so I said well can I use that <laughs> so I took those letters um and put f what I think are some of the feelings that go along with uh grieving during the holidays so the first s was for sad uh, I think, you know, a lot of people, whether they're, um, you know, one year out or, you know, however many years out, um, can feel some level of sadness during the holidays. So that's a challenge. Um, can feel uncomfortable uh, because we're put in situations and you know, we're going about our daily life in September. Uh, it's, it's not as big a deal, but it becomes uncomfortable as the seasonal things are, are all around us at the mall and outside and, and everywhere. Uh, it's also challenging. Challenging, uh, if you see me look off to the right, I'm just looking at some notes. Um, you know, challenging to make decisions about the holidays and communicate to people about the holidays. Uh, it also keeps us, this is the K, keeps us, um, keeps our pain fresh. You know, we might have kind of had scabbed over a little bit and it just kind of rips that off again. Uh, so that's another thing that we face during the holidays with our grief. And lastly, the last S, um, it, it steals our joy. Our grief can steal our joy during the holidays. You know, we want to be joyful. We want to be happy. We want to make good memories. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, this is a time where we really need to develop that ability to allow joy and misery to coexist. Uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I talk about that a lot, probably in every single podcast to some degree. Um, but uh, early in grief, everything is, is kind of black and white and there's no color in, you know, color is the joy, right? So sometimes during the holidays, like we're really experiencing them in black and white. Uh, and so, you know, that can be a challenge as well. So that, that's kind of, you know, the feelings and the experiences that I um, came up with, with that word sucks, uh, kind of encompasses it all. Um, so Loretta, you have some questions. I do. And I really think that is a great acronym um, that helps people sort of understand so thank you for sharing that with us. Okay, Pat, so you know this is always my question. What happens when you are the loved one of someone that is grieving or suffering a loss? Um, you know, we all want to help, but I know we can be obnoxious. We can be too helpful. We can be overbearing, um, you know, no conversations about chin up and all that. What, what do we do to help? Well, so we're talking about the holidays, right? So uh, I'll give you an example. I have a client who uh, she's going to her sister's for Thanksgiving. She just lost her son. 
uh, she's going to her sister's for Thanksgiving. Uh, and she said to her sister, she said, I'll go. I don't know how long I'm going to stay. Uh, but, you know, I'll at least go. And her sister said, that's fine. We just, we just want you to come and be with us because we're family. And so the way that her sister was a support was hearing what she, what, which my client needed, and then allowing her to do what she needed to do. Uh, and I often uh, suggest that people use the phrase for, for more difficult people, right? If family is difficult, uh, saying to them, I'm not expecting you to understand. I wouldn't want you to understand because it would mean that you lost whoever, right? Whoever this person lost. What I need for you to do is respect me enough to accept my decisions about what I need to do. So we want to get away from trying to over explain and get people to understand and just ask for their respect and acceptance. And that a lot of times saves, saves, a, saves a lot of, uh, you know, arguments back and forth. And it is accepting, isn't it, Pat, that even if someone wants to stay home and not participate in the holiday? Mm -hmm. Well, and in some of the perspectives and acceptances, I think that, that we as the grievers need to have are, um, uh, I tell my clients that the first three years, one to three years, look at them as transition years. You know, don't pressure yourself. Things are going to be different every holiday for the next one to three years. And let them be because you're you're readjusting, you're transitioning to a new set of traditions. You know, some might be kept, but other new ones may come in. So allow for that. Uh, the other thing is that um, you know it's different. We have to expect accept that it's going to be different each year. You know, for it's different for somebody in the raw grief, like my client who just lost her son in, in October, this October. Uh, and people who are four or five years out from a loss, they're still going to feel some of that, but, uh, you know, they're, they're just going to have a different experience and allowing ourselves to feel different each of those years. Uh, and then the other thing is that we can't go back. We, I hear people saying, you know, I just wish it was the way, like if there's, let's say mom was kind of the glue and everybody gathered around mom um uh and, and mom has passed and the family sort of fractures a little bit and it's just not that matriarch kind of situation and it, it sort of has happened that way in my family my father died and so you know the holidays are just not like they were so we can't go back and and that's part of our grief too it's the ripple effect right we're not just grieving sure. we're grieving the dynamics of the family during the holidays. We have to allow for that and then, but also be open to the new ways that it's going to, to adjust. Um, acknowledging that the holidays uh, uh, are, are gonna be tough. You know, we can't expect them not to be. Remembering that not everyone uh, will be grieving the same way. Sometimes people are expecting everybody to be feeling the same way as they are, but it depends on the relationship you had with the person, right? The people who had the closer relationship Absolutely. feeling it more. Um, remember that the way that uh, others will want to spend the holidays may not match the way you do. That's why the communication is so important. Uh, and I really encourage people to plan ahead. Don't, don't let them sneak up on you. Think about it. And I think, although early on, it kind of depends on how you feel that morning when you wake up, <laughs> when you're a little further out from your, your grief, uh, you know, a year or two years or, you know, several months, um, you can kind of think ahead and think, what am I going to be able to do and not able to do? Uh, because it's, you know, it, it's too raw still. Uh, and be honest. You know, people have to be, go ahead. Hey, you said something that, that always strikes me when you talk about grief. You, you know that old myth that it's one year. You know, after one year, you have to be normal or, you know, celebrate the holidays. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that expectation, I think, is put down so much on people who are grieving. You can't, um, you can't put a timeline on it. But, and I'll talk about, my next podcast is about complicated grief, uh, or they also call it complex grief or prolonged grief. Uh, uncomplicated grief, usually is six months to a year. Your brain does heal and it's, if, if you liken it to a physical um, uh, uh, injury, uncomplicated grief is, um, you know, had an ACL tear, had surgery within a year, you know, you're running again, right? Where complicated grief is, I got hit by a Mack truck and there are 20 broken bones in my body. Okay, you're just not going to heal up. You're going to need surgery after surgery, years of you know, rehabilitation. <laughs> okay, so there's a difference. Uh, and so we can't put everything in one box. My father was on complicated grief. Long life, had a great relationship, said all we needed to say, right? My son was complicated. So, uh, and that's another reason why we have to communicate too. We have, with ourselves, we have to know how we're really feeling and say, ooh, you know, I, I lost this person, but losing this person feels different. And we need to acknowledge that within ourselves uh, and then express that. Um, we have to ignore what people tell us we should do. Don't let anyone tell you what you should do. We can just I love that, Pat. That is so true. Um, that's anything in life, though, correct? <laughs> yeah. uh, we, have to, we need to give some thought to um, where we want to spend the holidays. You know, I have people say, you know, I need to go someplace different. We need to go down to the shore. We need to go to, you know, just a, an island uh, where it's just us, you know, whatever it may be. Um, uh, so giving... I have uh, somebody who's actually going to be down the casino on Thanksgiving <laughs> because uh, th their mother, they used to do a lot of cooking together on Thanksgiving. And so to be at home and cooking the traditional dinner and this, this person's mother died about six months ago, it's just too soon. Right. I can't do that. So we're, we're going, we're going down to Atlantic city and we're going to go to some, uh, some restaurant they like down there and, so that's what they're doing. It works. And that's okay. Uh, it's, it's important to know that you can skip holiday events, you know, and that's that awareness. Know if you're in overload. A lot of people will say, oh, come on, it's good to get out. It's good to get out. No, a certain amount of isolation is okay uh, for us to, to uh, buffer ourselves. Um, and, and it's really important to not feel guilty for skipping holiday events uh, because we've all we already are walking up a hill with you know bags of rocks in each hand we don't need to add another bag of rocks in each hand with guilt because that's the equivalent of what it's doing right the guilt is weighing us down and we, you know, we're already carrying this this huge amount of weight um, so not feeling guilty, don't get trapped. Make sure you either drive yourself or have somebody go with you who's willing to leave early. Uh, like that client I said, who was going to her sister's, you know, she knows she, because when we feel trapped, what happens, we get anxious. Right. Okay. So to avoid that, that anxiety, make sure you kind of have an exit plan. Um, uh, talk to kids about holidays. You know, some people have younger kids. And kids are confused, like, wait a minute, it's a happy time, but I feel sad. Or it's, it's supposed to be a happy time, but, you know, grandma's sad because grandpa's gone. You know, talk to them. You're kind of helping them understand, but also allowing them to feel joy. Because little ones, a lot of times, don't kind of understand what's going on, right? Exactly. But also the older ones. I have a client who... Um, has an adult son, lost a, a, a daughter a few years back. And this is the first year her son said to her, 
you know, I think I'm ready to get a tree. Wow. So we even, you know, talking with our adult children about where they're at in their process for the holidays. And so they're going to, and, and they all agree, yeah, you know what, we're, we're ready for a tree this year. But it was the son who, you know, brought that up. Initiated it, right. That's important too. Uh, you know, holiday cards, don't be a stickler about them. If you're a holiday, holiday card person, people will understand. Um, and again, don't feel guilty if you don't send the cards. Uh, same way with gifts, you know, skip them or minimize them. Uh, or make them meaningful. You know, instead of buying a gift for somebody, you know what, I'm going to, to donate in your name to whatever might be associated with the person who died. Um, don't go to the stores. You know, thank God we have online shopping now uh, because, you know, the Christmas music and the decorations and, you know, all that. Can all be triggers, right? Yeah, yeah, too much. Um, and again, don't feel guilty about not doing the gifts the way that you normally would uh, and you know accepting that crying is going to be okay in fact expect to cry <laughs> during the holidays uh, and and you know roll with it there's going to be, you're being triggered from from all sides uh, and lastly in this section here um, let perfectionism go if you're somebody who you know does the holidays perfectly does the Martha Stewart kind of a thing uh, it's really okay to in that first to third year to just let that go let somebody else help and, and that sort of thing how what are some ideas to to um sort of celebrate and remember the loved ones your loved ones during the holidays uh again deciding you know which traditions to to keep um and let go and some people say what i can't decide well you know what but it's because you're trying to decide on what's the right thing to do. Just make a decision and go with it. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, don't put a right and wrong judgment on it. Um, just choose something. Um, and everybody's different about, you know, some people want to stick to a lot of the traditions. Other people don't want any of it. And most people, there's some mix. We're going to keep this tradition, but but not that one, uh, and create new traditions. And here are some of those ideas. Um, some people put out a, a, a memory stocking, you know, where, uh, you know, put, they, they put it in a, um, a special place in the house and maybe have some keepsakes in there that they can kind of um, reminisce about and other family members can. Uh, you know, some people light a candle in like during the dinner. It's like this candle is so that we kind of feel the presence of grandpa, that, that sort of thing. Um, include one of their favorite dishes. Uh, and, and a client, <laughs> um, her, her father used to, um, uh, you know, be involved in especially the, the making of the pies. <laughs> But there was, he always took the first slice like, before and before it could. So, you know, the tradition is let's serve the pie with a piece out of it, right? Because uh, it couldn't wait. Um, so it's it, sometimes it can be humorous too because it it reminds us in a fond way uh, of the person uh, it, that in a memorial uh, wreath or ornament you know, uh, any kind of, you know, decoration sometimes people make with whether it's, uh, uh, maybe it's some parts of clothing, right? There are wreaths that, that are made out of cloth and things like that. Um, of course, there's the traditional going to the grave site and, you know, putting the grave blanket and those sorts of things. Uh, play your loved one's holiday, favorite holiday music. Now you might want to do that in private because it makes you feel close to them, but you can also cry because it might make you cry to do that. And that's okay. Uh, support, again, back to the kids is supporting um, the kids with doing maybe some memorial uh, grief uh, activities, you know, whether it's crafts or that sort of thing. Um, some people have like a memorial garden all year round, you know, out in their yard. Uh, and maybe the little ones do little crafts where they paint rocks or that sort of thing to, to 
put out there at the little memorial garden on the holiday. Some people leave an empty seat uh, for the person. For some people, that's too hard. Having a moment of silence or sharing about the person, you know, who let's, let's all share a funny story, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, maybe having an album of photographs uh, out where people can just, you know, at, as they feel comfortable, look at the pictures of the loved one, just, just you know, and, and maybe, you know, sit together, you know, a few people are, you know, over in the corner sitting together, looking at it together. Um, so those are all ways that, and I think Loretta, I gave you the link. You did. Um, so Loretta's going to put that on uh, a, a lot of these ideas. Um, I mean, I've shared with, with clients before I found this link, but uh, this was a pretty comprehensive one that uh, Loretta's going to put up for you to, to have because uh, you're not going to remember everything we talk about tonight. Um, so again, yeah, that has all the ideas on it, that, that link. It's, it's a great article. I actually read it before the podcast. 64 tips for coping with the grief at holidays. Mm -hmm. And some of the ideas you mentioned were there. It really was helpful. How have some of your clients managed through the holidays? Um, I know you were, have had permission to um, talk about some creative solutions. <laughs> uh, so I had one client who... Um, two years apart, the, the one year she had lost her daughter and then the, the next year uh, lost her significant other. And so she had two, um, you know, I guess they were about four foot or whatever, uh, trees on either side, you know, in, in pots um, of her fireplace. And she had the little ornaments the, that are photograph, you know, you can put a photograph in them. Mm -hmm. She had all photographs of her daughter and all photographs of her significant other. And that just, that's what, that was the all, those were the only decorations she had up, uh, you know, that particular year. Uh, another client who, you know, some people associate cardinals with their loved ones, right? And so she went online and found a bunch of like cardinal ornaments and, um, uh, you know, she had a, a regular tree, but there was a special tree. I think it was white so that the red would pop from the cardinals, right? It was a smaller tree and um, each cardinal represented, this was an older person, each cardinal represented uh, a lost loved one on there. Um, uh, I have a client who uh, got a full-size white tree and she had a full box of her adult sons uh, who passed um, all the ornaments that he made as a kid and also that were special to him. Like he was a Flyers fan, so there were Flyers ornaments and things like that. And she decorated the whole tree with just his ornaments. Uh, and recently I had a client who, um, I, I am drawing a blank right now as to why penguins are associated uh, with her son that she lost, but um, this year she's going to decorate with all penguins. Uh, and in fact, I was on the phone with her the other day, and her her uh, husband came home and and hollered up the steps. I got another penguin. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't wait to go down the steps and and find out what that penguin was. Uh, so there are these ways that are it's the tangible ways because the they're not here, right? The tangible is gone, but the intangible is not. And so we have those feelings about them, but how do we, how do we connect? Well, we use these symbolic things or actual things that they've touched, right? Like the, like the flyers ornament right? to, to make us feel that closeness. And that can be helpful. Have, what about those that their loss and grief is over a divorce or, um, you know, a job or moving to a new area? Sort of that loss where you just um, don't have the people there for whatever reason. Well, some, um, again, you, you've got to accept that it's going to be different, right? It's not going to be the, the traditional, uh, except that it's probably going to be black and white. Right? It's not going to be the same joy. Um, but sometimes people, I've found, uh, choose to uh, 
do things for others. Uh, for instance, I have a, a woman who through her divorce is not going to have her kids with her on Thanksgiving. Oh, that must be hard. So she's going to go work at a soup kitchen and, you know, serve the homeless Thanksgiving dinner. Um, uh, so here again, there's some ideas from that particular link. Uh, it says, if you've had um, trouble you know, parting with your loved one's clothing, the holidays, you know, can be an opportunity to donate those. Um, I have a couple who, who are donating their clothes to a, a children a children's home uh, and volunteering, like I just said, uh, uh, donating flowers or uh, um, you know other holiday decorations at the, the place of worship, because a lot of times poinsettias and things like that churches have, and you can uh, donate those. Uh, donating uh, you know holiday meals through the local church, uh, you know any kind of charity, um, uh, buying a gift that you would give. Like when, when Ricky died, uh, he was an infant. And so every year I gave to uh, Toys for Tots. And then when Starting Point started to uh, put out those tags for gifts for that, that homeless shelter, um, it, based on the year that Ricky was, that, that he would have been. But now he would be 19. So <laughs> I have to start over, well, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, go from there. Um, and so for people who've lost a loved one, they can, they can kind of, you know, give and maybe give in a way that's connected with that loved one. For people who, it's other things, like you said, loss of a job and, and that sort of thing. Uh, it, sometimes support comes in ways that we don't expect. You know, if, if you haven't been to church in a while and you're thinking about going back, you know, that's a place where, you never know what kind of connection you might have when you've lost all these other connections. Um, going there either back to your faith or talking with the pastor, or you might see somebody because, you know, people only come out at Christmas, right? You might see somebody you haven't seen in a long time and there's a, a reconnect with a friend. Uh, so with those other types of losses, um, isolation you know, can be more harmful. So, you know, if you're somebody who uh, is familiar with Starting Point, you know, Starting Point has groups and things that, that uh, you can, you know, maybe it's time. Maybe it's like the holidays are the time for me to go to the CODA group. Right. Uh, and, and let me use the, the holidays, that, that way of kind of um, jump-starting myself into the healing process. So that's another thing that people can do. Well, that's a great lead in to really talking about the griever's self care, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you, I know you feel very strongly about that. You want to talk about that a little? Well, usually when people are grieving, right, they don't feel like taking care of themselves, right? Uh, and, you know, you're not going to take care of yourself the, the way you might when you're not in this funk. Uh, but, but even the, you know, the, even a little bit can do a lot of self-care. Uh, so awareness, right? Watching the food we eat. I mean, we got to get down to the basics. Um, you know, it can make us feel better in the short term, but then it can can snowball. So even if we're going to eat the, the ice cream, like also eat a salad. You know, it's that sort of thing. I get that you might have some emotional eating, but but let's keep the nutrition in there too. Uh, because if our sugar levels are going up and down, what's that doing to our anxiety? What's that doing to our depression? Right? So we're not really- That's happy. a great point. Even for, even if you're not grieving, that's a great point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, watch the booze, right? Uh, we have to remember that it's a depressant. Uh, that it's, it, it might numb us, but it's also going to numb us to any joy that might sneak through. In other words, it numbs us to the pain, but it also numbs us to, to the good feelings. Uh, and it just, the, again, it's a depressant. So we have to be careful with that because we're already, we're already grieving, so we're depressed. Uh, you know, we've already gone to the basement. Let's, let's not start digging a hole deeper. Um, uh, 
if you're stressed about making um, the holiday dinner, just don't. You know, it's it's okay to have self compassion, um, to to care about, to take care of yourself, and not pressure yourself. Uh, asking for help, you know, ask for other people to look. You know what? I usually cook the dinner. All I'm doing is throwing the turkey, and everybody else has to bring everything else. You know that. Um, even if you're somebody who doesn't ask for help, guess what? This may be the time to start. And what better time to ask for help than when we need it, right? Um, uh, identify the people who will be able to help and support you. And this is, again, is about uh, preparing for the holidays, right? Who, who's gonna be a support and who's gonna be a pain in my neck? Who's gonna be you know, the friend who's gonna say, come on, come on, come out, come out, go to this party, go to this party, man, I have people like that. It's like, you know what? You need to kind of put a buffer between you and those people right now. Who are the people who are gonna to listen to what you need? Make sure there's a distinction and you're not doing something wrong. Boundaries are okay. Um, prioritize and don't overcommit. Like what are the most important things and let the rest go. Uh, you know, make that, that list too about, you know, the things that you don't want to forget. Like, you know, maybe you have grandchildren, right? And you don't want to, you know, forget what they told you they want for Christmas or, or whatever. Uh, write things down because you have grief brain. If anybody listened to the grief brain podcast, uh, you know, you're, you're, you have grief Alzheimer's. You're not remembering things. So, you know, write those things down. Um, and, Part of self-care is uh, keeping an openness to gratitude. I know that seems counterproductive when we're grieving, but there are still the living. So it's okay for us to be grateful for the people who are still here. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be grandiose. It can be, you know, we're, we're grateful that we have a, warm house, even if that house doesn't have the person in it who used to be, you see. It doesn't have to be a pure gratitude. It doesn't have to, remember, misery and joy coexist. So misery and gratitude can coexist too, right? I can, Absolutely. I, I, can, I can feel like something, I can feel the emptiness of that person not being in my home while also being grateful that this winter I'm in a warm home. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So allowing ourselves to um, to do that, and you know, ultimately, if if we can't face it, it's really okay, especially if you're early on, to just pull the covers over your head and and hold your breath and wait for the holidays to pass. Uh, it really is. We're not doing anything wrong, no matter what you know others say. We're grieving, and that's it. Um, uh, I'm just looking at a, a couple more uh, ideas here, that it is okay to be happy. Now, maybe it's hard to feel that the first year, but the second and third year, say, sometimes people feel, feel guilty for feeling any bit of happiness because they feel like they're betraying their loved one. Uh, but wouldn't your loved one want you to feel happiness? And so in that way, you're sort of honoring that. It really is, it's part of the healing process for us to allow some happiness to come in. Uh, you know, especially when new life comes in, you know, someone dies, a new baby is born sometimes in families. And uh, to allow ourselves to celebrate that. You know, going to grief groups or going online to grief groups, that's a, a way, you know, to have self-care, quiet time, just being with yourself, um, doing what you need to do, whether it's watching TV, whether it's reading, whether it's sleeping, anything that is, you know, pay attention. What am I feeling? What do I need? That's the self-care. Uh, and the last thing is just kind of those um, grief coping skills. Uh, we can use journaling. You know, I journaled a lot after Ricky. Uh, that was very helpful cried to sad music. That was part of my process. Some people do yoga uh, or meditation. 
because there are healing meditations. Um, uh, make a comfort list. I have, uh, this is the, the last thing I want to share on this because I think it's really important. Uh, a lot of times we'll go to our default. Like we just know that we're feeling all out of sorts with our grief. And if food is your thing, that's what you're going to go to. No, no matter whether you're feeling angry in your grief, sad, guilty, whatever it is. A comfort list, write out the emotions that you're feeling throughout your grief. And on the other side, write out what are the things that I can do to address these particular feelings? Because a lot of times all we're doing is burying it in the food or the alcohol instead of addressing it directly. We need to customize. So if I feel sad, there might be three different things that I do. Maybe I need to call a friend. Maybe I need to sleep because I'm sad and also tired. Maybe I need to just have a good cry. If I'm angry, maybe I need to take a good brisk walk to, because I have all this pent up, right? When we don't have that list, what do we do for a food person? We go to the refrigerator. If we're sad, we go to the refrigerator. If we're angry, we go to the refrigerator. You see what I'm saying? We go to the default, where if we make the comfort list, we have a better chance of really addressing what we're experiencing and feeling directly. And that actually helps with our healing instead of sabotaging us and meeting our feelings where they really are. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a technique that can be helpful. Um, it sounds like the self-care is making sure you're in tune with everything you're feeling and addressing it, which really is a life lesson, isn't it? About everything. Right. Self-awareness. Absolutely. Uh, self-awareness, I think, and not, um, not judging yourself around it, around any of it. We do get judgy, don't we, on on ourselves. <laughs> the advocate for eye organ and tissue donation is the easiest way, is like I said in the Is that somebody chiming in? No, we got it. Let's <laughs> see if that was somebody asking a, a question. Um, so well, the Pat, I think this has been really helpful. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we will be doing a part three of doing grief well. And I suspect by the time we do that one, Pat will come up with a part four. Um, so we will continue to um, advertise them on Starting Points website. The uh, doing grief well part three is about complicated and uncomplicated grief. And we intend to have that for you in January. So thank you all for joining us and thank you to our audience for participating. Um, this is the Starting Point Education Channel. Have a good night.